Part 4 of Chapter 10 of Book 1 of The Wealth of Nations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Escalera. The Wealth of Nations by Adam Smith. Part 4 of Chapter 10 of Book 1 of wages and profit in the different employments of labor and stock the inhabitants of a town being collected into one place can easily combine together the most insignificant trades carried on in towns have accordingly in some place or other been incorporated and even where they have never been incorporated yet the corporation spirit the jealousy of strangers the aversion to take apprentices or to communicate the secret of their trade generally prevail in them and often teach them by voluntary associations and agreements to prevent that free competition which they cannot prohibit by by-laws the trades which employ but a small number of hands run most easily into such combinations half a dozen wool combers perhaps are necessary to keep a thousand spinners and weavers at work by combining not to take apprentices they can not only engross the employment but reduce the whole manufacture into a sort of slavery to themselves and raise the price of their labour much above what is due to the nature of their work the inhabitants of the country dispersed in distant places cannot easily combine together they have not only never been incorporated but the incorporation spirit never has prevailed among them no apprenticeship has ever been thought necessary to qualify for husbandry the great trade of the country after what are called the fine arts and the liberal professions however there is perhaps no trade which requires so great a variety of knowledge and experience the innumerable volumes which have been written upon it in all languages may satisfy us that among the wisest and most learned nations it has never been regarded as a matter very easily understood and from all those volumes we shall in vain attempt to collect that knowledge of its various and complicated operations which is commonly possessed even by the common farmer how contemptuously soever the very contemptible authors of some of them may sometimes affect to speak of him there is scarce any common mechanic trade on the contrary of which all the operations may not be as completely and distinctly explained in a pamphlet of a very few pages as it is possible for words illustrated by figures to explain them in the history of the arts now publishing by the french academy of sciences several of them are actually explained in this manner the direction of operations besides which must be varied with every change of the weather as well as with many other accidents requires much more judgment and discretion than that of those which are always the same or very nearly the same not only the art of the farmer the general direction of the operations of husbandry but many inferior branches of country labour require much more skill and experience than the greater part of mechanic trades the man who works upon brass and iron works with instruments and upon materials of which the temper is always the same or very nearly the same but the man who ploughs the ground with a team of horses or oxen works with instruments of which the health strength and temper are very different upon different occasions the condition of the materials which he works upon too is as variable as that of the instruments which he works with and both require to be managed with much judgment and discretion the common ploughman though generally regarded as the pattern of stupidity and ignorance is seldom defective in this judgment and discretion he is less accustomed indeed to social intercourse than the mechanic who lives in a town his voice and language are more uncouth and more difficult to be understood by those who are not used to them his understanding however being accustomed to consider a great variety of objects is generally much superior to that of the other whose whole attention from morning till night is commonly occupied in performing one or two very simple operations how much the lower ranks of people in the country are really superior to those of the town is well known to every man whom either business or curiosity has led to converse much with both in china and indostan accordingly both the rank and the wages of the common labourers are said to be superior to those of the greater part of artificers and manufacturers they would probably be so everywhere if corporation laws and the corporation spirit did not prevent it the superiority which the industry of the towns has everywhere in europe over that of the country is not altogether owing to corporations and corporation laws it is supported by many other regulations the high duties upon foreign manufactures and upon all goods imported by alien merchants all tend to the same purpose corporation laws enable the inhabitants of town to raise their prices without fearing to be undersold by the free competition of their own countrymen those other regulations secure them equally against that of foreigners 
the enhancement of price occasioned by both is everywhere finally paid by the landlords farmers and labourers of the country who have seldom opposed the establishment of such monopolies they have commonly neither inclination nor fitness to enter into combinations, and the clamour and sophistry of merchants and manufacturers easily persuade them that the private interest of a part and of a subordinate part of the society is the general interest of the whole. In Great Britain, the superiority of the industry of the towns over that of the country seems to have been greater formerly than in the present times. The wages of country labour approach nearer to those of manufacturing labour, and the profits of stock employed in agriculture to those of trading and manufacturing stock, than they are said to have none in the last century or in the beginning of the present. This change may be regarded as the necessary, though very late consequence, of the extraordinary encouragement given to the industry of the towns. The stocks accumulated in them come in time to be so great that it can no longer be employed with the ancient profit in that species of industry which is peculiar to them. That industry has its limits like every other, and the increase of stock, by increasing the competition, necessarily reduces the profit. The lowering of profit in the town forces out stock to the country where, by creating a new demand for country labor, it necessarily raises its wages. It then spreads itself, if I may say so, over the face of the land, and, by being employed in agriculture, is in part restored to the country, at the expense of which, in a great measure, it had originally been accumulated in the town that everywhere in europe the greatest improvements of the country have been owing to such overflowings of the stock originally accumulated in the towns i shall endeavour to show hereafter and at the same time to demonstrate that though some countries have by this course attained to a considerable degree of opulence it is in itself necessarily slow uncertain liable to be disturbed and interrupted by innumerable accidents and in every respect contrary to the order of nature and of reason the interests, prejudices, laws, and customs which have given occasion to it, I shall endeavour to explain as fully and distinctly as I can in the third and fourth books of this inquiry. People of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public, or in some contrivance to raise prices. It is impossible, indeed, to prevent such meetings by any law which either could be executed, or would be consistent with liberty and justice. But though the law cannot hinder people of the same trade from sometimes assembling together, it ought to do nothing to facilitate such assemblies, much less to render them necessary. A regulation which obliges all those of the same trade in a particular town to enter their names and places of abode in a public register facilitates such assemblies. It connects individuals who might never otherwise be known to one another, and gives every man of the trade a direction where to find every other man of it. A regulation which enables those of the same trade to tax themselves, in order to provide for their poor, their sick, their widows and orphans, by giving them a common interest to manage, renders such assemblies necessary. An incorporation not only renders them necessary, but makes the act of the majority binding upon the whole. In a free trade, an effectual combination cannot be established but by the unanimous consent of every single trader, and it cannot last longer than every single trader continues of the same mind. The majority of a corporation can enact a by-law with proper penalties which will limit the competition more effectually and more durably than any voluntary combination whatever. The pretense that corporations are necessary for the better government of the trade is without any foundation. The real and effectual discipline which is exercised over a workman is not that of his corporation but that of his customers. It is the fear of losing their employment which restrains his frauds and corrects his negligence. An exclusive corporation necessarily weakens the force of this discipline. A particular set of workmen must then be employed, let them behave well or ill. It is upon this account that, in many large incorporated towns, no tolerable workmen are to be found, even in some of the most necessary trades. If you would have your work tolerably executed, it must be done in the suburbs, where the workmen, having no exclusive privilege, have nothing but their character to depend upon, and you must then smuggle it into the town as well as you can. It is in this manner that the policy of Europe, by restraining the competition in some employments to a smaller number than would otherwise be disposed to enter into them, occasions a very important inequality in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labour and stock. Secondly, the policy of Europe, by increasing the competition in some employments beyond what it naturally would be, occasions another equality of an opposite kind in the whole of the advantages and disadvantages of the different employments of labour and stock. 
it has been considered as of so much importance that a proper number of young people should be educated for certain professions that sometimes the public and sometimes the piety of private founders have established many pensions scholarships exhibitions bursaries etc for this purpose which draw many more people into those trades than could otherwise pretend to follow them in all christian countries i believe the education of the greater part of churchmen is paid for in this manner very few of them are educated altogether at their own expense the long tedious and expensive education therefore of those who are will not always procure them a suitable reward the church being crowded with people who in order to get employment are willing to accept of a much smaller recompense than what such an education would otherwise have entitled them to and in this manner the competition of the poor takes away the reward of the rich it would be indecent no doubt to compare either a curate or a chaplain with a journeyman in any common trade the pay of a curate or chaplain however may very properly be considered as of the same nature with the wages of a journeyman they are all three paid for their work according to the contract which they may happen to make with their respective superiors till after the middle of the fourteenth century five mercs containing about as much silver as ten pounds of our present money was in england the usual pay of a curate or a stipendary parish priest as we find it regulated by the decrees of several different national councils at the same period fourpence a day containing the same quantity of silver as a shilling of our present money was declared to be the pay of a master mason and threepence a day equal to ninepence of our present money that of a journeyman mason the wages of both these labourers therefore supposing them to have been constantly employed were much superior to those of the curate the wages of the master mason supposing him to have been without employment one-third of the year would have fully equalled them by the twelfth of queen anne c twelve it is declared that whereas for want of sufficient maintenance and encouragement to curates the cures have in several places been meanly supplied the bishop is therefore empowered to appoint by writing under his hand and seal a sufficient certain stipend or allowance not exceeding fifty and not less than twenty pounds a year forty pounds a year is reckoned at present very good pay for a curate and notwithstanding this act of parliament there are many curacies under twenty pounds a year there are journeymen shoemakers in london who earn forty pounds a year and there is scarce an industrious workman of any kind in that metropolis who does not earn more than twenty this last sum indeed does not exceed what is frequently earned by common labourers in many country parishes whenever the law has attempted to regulate the wages of workmen it has always been rather to lower them than to raise them but the law has upon many occasions attempted to raise the wages of curates and for the dignity of the church to oblige the rectors of parishes to give them more than the wretched maintenance which they themselves might be willing to accept of it and in both cases the law seems to have been equally ineffectual and has never either been able to raise the wages of curates or to sink those of labourers to the degree that was intended because it has never been able to hinder either the one from being willing to accept of less than the legal allowance on account of the indigence of their situation and the multitude of their competitors or the other from receiving more on account of the contrary competition of those who expected to derive either profit or pleasure from employing them the great benefices and other ecclesiastical dignities support the honour of the church notwithstanding the mean circumstances of some of its inferior members the respect paid to the profession too makes some compensation even to them for the meanness of their pecuniary recompense in england and in all roman catholic countries the lottery of the church is in reality much more advantageous than is necessary the example of the churches of scotland of geneva and of several other protestant churches may satisfy us that in so creditable a profession in which education is so easily procured the hopes of much more moderate benefices will draw a sufficient number of learned decent and respectable men into holy orders in professions in which there are no benefices such as law and physic if an equal proportion of people were educated at the public expense the competition would soon be so great as to sink very much of their pecuniary reward it might then not be worth any man's while to educate his son to either of those professions at his own expense they would be entirely abandoned to such as had been educated by those public charities whose numbers and necessities would oblige them in general to content themselves with a very miserable recompense to the entire degradation of the now respectable professions of law and physic that unprosperous race of men commonly called men of letters are pretty much in the situation which lawyers and physicians probably would be in upon the foregoing supposition in every part of europe the greater part of them have been educated for the church but have been hindered by different reasons from entering into holy orders 
They have generally, therefore, been educated at the public expense, and their numbers are everywhere so great as commonly to reduce the price of their labor to a very paltry recompense. Before the invention of the art of printing, the only employment by which a man of letters could make anything by his talents was that of a public or private teacher, or by communicating to other people the curious and useful knowledge which he had acquired himself. And this is still surely a more honorable, a more useful, and, in general, even a more profitable employment than that other of writing for a bookseller, to which the art of printing has given occasion. The time and study, the genius, knowledge, and application requisite to qualify an eminent teacher of the sciences are at least equal to what is necessary for the greatest practitioners in law and physic. But the usual reward of the eminent teacher bears no proportion to that of the lawyer or physician, because the trade of the one is crowded with indigent people who have been brought up to it at the public expense, whereas those of the other two are encumbered with very few who have not been educated at their own. The usual recompense, however, of public and private teachers, small as it may appear, would undoubtedly be less than it is if the competition of those yet more indigent men of letters who write for bread was not taken out of the market. Before the invention of the art of printing, a scholar and a beggar seem to have been terms very nearly synonymous. The different governors of the universities before that time appear to have often granted licenses to their scholars to beg. In ancient times, before any charities of this kind had been established for the education of indigent people to the learned professions, the rewards of eminent teachers appear to have been much more considerable. Isocrates, in what is called his discourse against the sophists, reproaches the teachers of his own times with inconsistency. They make the most magnificent promises to their scholars, says he, and undertake to teach them to be wise, to be happy, and to be just and, in return for so important a service, they stipulate the paltry reward of four or five minae. They who teach wisdom, continues he, ought certainly to be wise themselves, but if any man were to sell such a bargain for such a price, he would be convicted of the most evident folly. He certainly does not mean here to exaggerate the reward, and we may be assured that it was not less than he represents. Four minae were equal to thirteen pounds, six shillings, and eight pence, five minae to sixteen pounds, thirteen shillings, and fourpence. Something not less than the largest of those two sums, therefore, must at that time have been usually paid to the most eminent teachers of Athens. Isocrates himself demanded ten minae, or thirty-three pounds, six shilling, and eight pence, from each scholar. When he taught at Athens, he is said to have had a hundred scholars. I understand this to be the number whom he taught at one time, or who attended what we would call one course of lectures a number which will not appear extraordinary from so great a city to so famous a teacher, who taught, too, what was at that time the most fashionable of all sciences, rhetoric. He must have made, therefore, by each course of lectures, a thousand minae, or three thousand three hundred and thirty-five pounds, six shillings, eightpence. A thousand minae, accordingly, is said by Plutarch, in another place, to have been his didactron, or usual price of teaching. Many other eminent teachers in those times appear to have acquired great fortunes. Georgius made a present to the temple of Delphi of his own statue in solid gold. We must not, I presume, suppose it was as large as the life. His way of living, as well as that of Hippias and Protagoras, two other eminent teachers of those times, is represented by Plato as splendid, even to ostentation. Plato himself is said to have lived with a good deal of magnificence. Aristotle, after having been tutor to Alexander, and most munificently rewarded, as it is universally agreed, both by him and his father Philip, thought it worth while, notwithstanding, to return to Athens, in order to resume the teaching of his school. Teachers of the sciences were probably in those times less common than they came to be in an age or two afterwards, when the competition had probably somewhat reduced both the price of their labor and the admiration of their persons. The most eminent of them, however, appear always to have enjoyed a degree of consideration much superior to any of the like profession in the present times. The Athenians sent Carniage the academic, and Diogenes the stoic, upon a solemn embassy to Rome, and though their city had then declined from its former grandeur, it was still an independent and considerable republic. Carniage, too, was a Babylonian by birth, and as there never was a people more jealous of admitting foreigners to public offices than the Athenians, their consideration for him must have been very great. This inequality is, upon the whole, perhaps rather advantageous than hurtful to the public. It may somewhat degrade the profession of a public teacher, but the cheapness of literary education is surely an advantage which greatly overbalances this trifling inconveniency. 
the public too might derive still greater benefit from it if the constitution of those schools and colleges in which education is carried on was more reasonable than it is at present through the greater part of europe end of book one chapter ten part four